debate. The Rules Committee negotiates the structure for debate on the floor. The House is expected to take up health care reform in the next few weeks. Mr. Dreyer will very ably represent the minority, <clears throat> and we will continue. We'll take testimony until about 1 o'clock and uh, recess for, for lunch, and uh, I don't know if we'll continue after that. It all depends on the action of the House. The uh, next uh, member to... Uh, to testify before the committee is the Honorable Henry Waxman of California. Do you want to be? Well, uh, you call, you have a panel. Do you'd like to come forward with you? I remember yesterday, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Mr. Wiley and Mr. Morgan were here and we were starting with them. Yes, all right. Come, I'll come up then. Are you in that group, Cliff, too? All right, come on up. Uh, let's see, is uh, Mr. Bill Rackus? Is he in that group too? All right. Mr. Chairman, we're all from the Energy and Commerce Committee, although we're here with different points of view. But if, I, if I might just start off, I, I have a statement from the Chairman of the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, the Honorable John D. Dingle, and I ask unanimous consent to be put Without in the Without objection, record. the statement will appear on the record. And I have a statement as well. Mr. Objection. Waxman's statement will also appear on the record. Well, I, I'm proud to have this opportunity to appear before this committee today in support of the health reform legislation submitted by our Majority Leader, Dick Gephardt. And I want to express uh, my appreciation to Mr. Gephardt for his leadership in bringing this bill before you and the Rules Committee and involving our committee in its development. Uh, we're at a critical turning point. We can choose to continue down the same path we've been on, more Americans losing their health insurance, escalating health care costs, and larger and larger government cutbacks in health pro programs for the elderly and the poor. This means that providers will continue to shift their losses from Medicare and Medicaid onto their private patients and employers. And that is basically the direction the Republican and bipartisan proposals will take us. Or we can decide to end our national embarrassment and guarantee every American coverage for basic health care. That's the path the majority leader believes this country should take, and I vigorously agree with him. Mr. Gephardt has put together a bill that assures that most Americans who now, now have insurance coverage through their jobs will be able to keep that coverage. Health insurance paid for by employer and worker contributions is the way most Americans get coverage today, and the Gephardt bill builds on that arrangement. As a practical matter, that's the only way we can achieve universal coverage, and the opponents of this bill know it. Opponents of universal coverage will argue that the Gephardt bill is a government takeover of health care. This is pure demagoguery and nothing more. Uh, do these people honestly think that the Medicare program is a government takeover of our health care system? Most of my elderly and disabled constituents know that without Medicare to pay for the uh, private physician and hospital care they need, they would be totally unprotected. The facts are, in the Gephardt bill, most Americans will get private health insurance coverage from their employer, and they will have more choice than they do today. Americans will be able to enroll in the same plans that are available to members of Congress and our families. They can enroll in a private plan of their choice, and if they are low income, get assistance with a premium subsidy, or they can choose to enroll in an expanded <coughs> Medicare program. This isn't a government takeover plan. It's a government doing what it should, providing a safety net. The rule you fashion should make the choice before the House crystal clear. 
those who want to vote against guaranteeing other Americans the same benefits that they and their families have should have that opportunity. And those of us who support universal coverage should have the opportunity to vote for the Get Part Bill. Thank you for allowing me to give this uh, Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mohat. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's no question but what the health care debate is the major debate that's taken place in the Congress over the period that I've been in it. Uh, I strongly support the Roland Bill O'Rourke's bill and the, and the bipartisan legislation that's been worked on, as well as the Michael bill. Okay. According to the Los Angeles Times, 73% of the people in the United States believe that we're going too far with the Gephardt proposal that we should go a step at a time to solve the problems. And over 60% are dead set against the get by proposal. Well, so you know, it's, we, I, can I so interrupt? Uh, I've seen polls from the California paper a couple of weeks ago that 64% of the people said they wouldn't vote for anybody who voted against health care. So I don't know where these polls are taking. We're, 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 off, we're offering health care legislation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we, we have an important debate ahead of us. Uh, how the House conducts the consideration of health care reform will be viewed with deep interest by the American people. All of us are no doubt aware that the very personal concerns that our constituents have about, have about the sweeping changes we're considering with regard to health care. And that they're out there. People are feeling it. We're getting calls all the time, and I'm sure you are too. With the public trust clearly at stake, we owe it to our constituents to undertake the most vigorous debate and consideration we're capable of as the people's house. Uh, I therefore urge your zealous pursuit of a rule that allows members to exercise and protect this public trust. This committee is the key to that promise that we have to the people. For the Energy and Commerce Committee, we request five hours of general debate to be equally divided between the majority and the minority. We also recommend that each substitute be afforded an ample amount of time as well as equal amount of time for debate. The polls indicate that confusion and concern have steadily mounted as our constituents try to understand what Congress is considering. We need to take the time to tell them what these bills do and what they will cost and how the quality of care and delivery of services may be affected. I strongly urge that the Michael Bill H.R. 3080 the Affordable Health Care Act now be made in order as a substitute. As the records reflect, we undertook to draft a bill on health care reform last Congress under Mr. Michael's leadership because we reviewed, the, we viewed this as a top priority. I would also like to take the opportunity to commend Mr. Hassard for his work on the Republican Health Task Force. I remain a co-sponsor of H.R. 3080 in this Congress. It is the health care reform bill with the largest number of co-sponsors because it prescribes changes that will amply assure needed reform. Specifically, it provides portability of insurance so that insurance coverage can travel with Americans from job to job, coverage for pre-existing conditions which can prevent many Americans from getting insurance coverage, measures to reduce administrative waste con control, fraud, and reform our medical malpractice system to drive down costs antitrust reform to allow hospitals to share expensive medical equipment and become more efficient, and expanded public access to community health centers. What this bill does not do is to kill jobs by placing unnecessary mandates on employers. It does not take away a person's choice of physician. It does not put the control of the health care system in the government hands. I think we should take the approach of keeping the better parts of the world's finest health care system and fix only its problems as the Michael Bill does. I also strongly urge that the bipartisan bill, sponsored by Dr. Rowland and other members of the bipartisan group, be made in order as a substitute. I understand this bill seeks to achieve greater health care coverage with no new taxes, no mandates, and no tax caps. At the same time, it assures the quality of care for America, that Americans deserve and their choice of doctors. As a bipartisan product, it merits full and fair consideration on the floor. I would further urge that the king of the hill not be used. In our view, it's an unfair procedure which could easily result in the bill with the lowest majority vote winning. It is no way to legislate health care reform for every American. 
Let the votes determine the passage of the bill which the largest majority of members choose to support. That's the bill that we should uh, see to win. I appreciate this opportunity to testify and commend all of you for your serious responsibility uh, that you're undertaking here. You have a big job. You probably have the most important job of all because largely depending upon the fairness of the rule will depend the outcome of this legislation. And I know all of our people are very, very concerned about what we do. I hope that you will provide a rule that is fair to all points of view. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Thomas Blyley, Jr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to give you the seat. Uh, thank you, Henry. Well, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to make my statement. Uh, uh, Without the objection, record. the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. I'm not here to argue the plans. <clears throat> what I'm here to do today is to talk about a rule. And I think it's most important when we're considering one seventh of the economy that we give this full debate. The president sent his bill up here. It was referred to three committees, Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, and the Education and Labor. I would recommend that the committee allow five hours for each of those three committees to be divided equally between majority and minority. There was also referred to six other committees, and I would recommend that the committee grant the, for lesser parts, but I would suggest that those committees be given two hours to be divided between the majority and the minority. And then we have uh, at least four substitutes that I'm aware of, or four, four plans, the, the, the Gephardt plan, uh, the uh, single-payer plan, the plan, uh, the major minority leaders plan, and the bipartisan plan. That adequate time be given for those uh, to be explained and to be divided again uh, equally between the majority and the minority. Finally, let me say this. Uh, I hope that we won't use this king of the hill thing as my colleague uh, from California, uh, Mr. Moore, had said. Uh, King of Hill is a game that kids play on a playground. This is not a game. This is very serious. We're talking about the health uh, of 250 million plus Americans and their successors. And I would hope that we would have a base bill, which would probably be if certainly the leadership bill uh, of Mr. Gephardt, and then you would have the others as substitutes. And uh, when the day is over, uh, and to final passage, hopefully you'd be voting for the one that got the most votes. When the day is over, with all that time, I think you mean when the week is over. Well, well, I, I don't think a week is too much time to spend when you're talking about a bill that's as major as this. I think this bill is as every, every bit as important and every bit as uh, big as was the Wagner Act in 1937 uh, that created Social Security. So I think that you, you know, you do need to give it plenty of time. It's complex. I mean, uh, 13, 1,400 pages. Uh, <clears throat> and it needs to be thoroughly aired. Thank you very much. Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it is an honor to come here with my colleagues from Energy and Commerce to talk to you. And Good morning to my colleagues on the Republican side. <laughs> Tony, nice to see you. In survey after survey, when people ask about their preference for a new health insurance system, they make two points. First, they want to feel more secure about their health insurance, and they don't want to worry that they will lose their health insurance if they lose their jobs if they, or if they get sick. Secondly, they want to have choices when it comes to their health insurance. They want choices of plans, choices of doctors, and choices of hospital. And I don't think I have to tell this committee that health care reform is not a, bipart a partisan issue. It is an issue which is not even a campaign issue. It's too important for all Americans. Americans realize that our health care system has some serious problems and needs fixing. But they're also very concerned that we do no harm. They do not want us to make it worse. 
They do not want a quick fix or a band-aid approach simply because the calendar is getting closer and closer to election day. They do not want us to be over, do not want to be overbilled for unneeded layers of bureaucracy. Nor do they want us to perform major surgery on our health care delivery system before we get a second opinion. In fact, a recent poll which appeared in the August 15, 1994 issue of Newsweek magazine indicates that two out of three people think that Congress should wait until next year to reform the health care system. If we proceed with caution, however, and carefully examine the many options before us, there is no reason why we should not vote on health care reform this year. I would urge the members of this important committee to grant a rule which will permit us to debate, debate health care reform in the careful and deliberate manner that it deserves. I join with my Republican colleagues on the committee in asking that the Committee on Energy and Commerce, the Committee on Ways and Means, and the Committee on Education and Labor each receive a minimum of five hours of general debate time, with the time equally divided between the majority and the minority on each committee. I also agree that the six other committees which received a referral on the Clinton health care bill should be granted two hours of general debate time, with the time equally divided between the majority and minority on each of these committees. I sincerely hope, Mr. Chairman, that the rule granted by this committee does not sacrifice free and open debate on all the issues simply for the sake of expediency. As a ranking Republican member of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Competitiveness, I participated in a number of hearings last fall and earlier this year which examined very closely all aspects of the Clinton health care bill. And as a result, I have some serious concern about the Clinton plan, ability to deliver the kind of health care system that the American people want. And Mr. Chairman, I will be back at a later date to present uh, H.R. 4550 to you, the Consumer Choice Health Security Act uh, that I have uh, been a major um, proponent of. I would like to briefly mention uh, some of the other substitute men amendments that are pending before you. Unlike my bill, uh, which I submitted to the Rules Committee, most of the substitutes seem to have developed um, behind closed doors without the full public disclosure. And that's why I'm very concerned about us rushing to debate and uh, rushing to pass health care legislation. But I would like to mention the bipartisan substitute. It's been supported by both Democrats and Republicans. It's been put together by my friend Michael Bilirakis, who is from Florida, and of course my colleague uh, Roy Rowland, who I serve with on the Energy and Commerce. Both of these men have put in a lot of time, as you know and many other members have, hard work in crafting this substitute. And I think all the members owe them a debt of gratitude for their efforts. In the interest of fairness, I urge the Rules Committee to grant a rule which provides, one, that all of the substitute amendments receive an equal amount of time for a full and open debate when the time is equally divided between the majority and minority. And two, that all of the substitutes be accorded the same amount of debate time. To do otherwise would deny the American people their right to a full airing of all the issues. And Mr. Chairman, in closing, I would like to remind my colleagues of the old joke, quote, the operation was a success, but the patient died. We should not rush to judgment. The patient didn't think that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> We must not let that become the epithet for our health care delivery system. We deserve better. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chairman. Uh, I thank the uh, panel for its uh, very interesting uh, testimony here today. Uh, as I figured out, you're asking for 57 hours of debate time. That's quite a day's work. <laughs> Well, Mr. Chairman, this represents one seventh of the national Congress. I hear that. So. <laughs> it's uh, and you have other amendments you're going to uh, propose later. I'll offer HR uh, forty five fifty, which is a voluntary health care system based upon individual uh, requirements. Well, does your plan have uh, the the basic coverages that we talk about, universal coverage and uh, uh, pre-existing conditions. Portability. Portability. Insurance reforms. Yeah. Malpractice insurance reforms. Yeah. 
It has all that in there. Mm -hmm. And do, do uh, CBO have a cost <coughs> estimate on your plan yet? It's, it, it has, uh, and it's been scored by Lou and DHI, too. I'll be glad to provide that to the committee. <coughs> and does it fall within the range of the other proposals as uh, cost-wise? It's quite an improvement over the Clinton plan, the original Clinton plan. And it uh, is uh, over a five-year period, it's budget neutral. Budget neutral over five years. Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And we thank all, as you did, sir, all of, our, all of the folks from Energy and Commerce for coming up and, and speaking to us and commend you for all of your hard work. You've all been, I guess, immersed in this issue for months and months, especially my friend Mr. Waxman and my colleague and, and neighbor from Los Angeles who's been immersed in this subject for years and years. It goes without saying that this is a complex and a difficult and maybe even more than that, extremely important subject matter. Mr. Chairman, I feel, having sat here for the, just the last couple of days listening to these folks and to others from other committees who've come bef before us, uh, I'm feeling more and more strongly, if I may express it that way, uh, that we've got to spend, that we, in order to do this job right, we've got to spend a lot of time on it on the floor. I agree with our friend from Florida, Mr. Stearns. You shouldn't wait. We should try to do it now. We should try to do it this year. I, I think you have to force issues, otherwise people are only too happy to back away from them. People talk about putting over till next year, but we'll be facing the exact same questions and problems and political concerns next year, and you just, we just have to go at it and try to, try, to solve, try to solve this thing. I would hope, and unfortunately, as Chairman Wells well knows, the leadership doesn't always I mean, we're not in charge of scheduling around here, and leadership doesn't always pay attention to us if we do suggest things. I really wish we would spend two or three weeks on the floor on this issue. I really wish we would start off with five hours apiece for each of the major committees, let them talk it out, just talk about things. As, as the chair and other members know, those are not always terribly useful times because uh, it's a limited amount of time and, and the debate time is divided up and everybody wants to speak for two or three or four minutes and there's no real discussion, they're just statements by members. So I think we ought to spend a week or two or three days getting all that stuff out of the way. Then I think we ought to really spend like a full day at least on the major substitutes. I was really impressed, Mr. Chairman, yesterday and today too, although we didn't get into the specifics of it nearly so much as we did yesterday. We were sitting around here for two, three hours, and all of us know something about this subject matter, but I was amazed at how many things we all learned, if I may include us all in that, how many good questions were asked, how much stuff came from the members from both, both sides of the aisle in, in response to our questions. I mean, it was a learning process for those of us who were up here. We four and a couple of others, I think, were, were here for most of it. And we ought to do the exact same thing on the floor. In fact, I mean, most members don't know enough about any of these proposals. That's the truth. Uh, and our Republican friends tend to shy away from Mr. Gephardt's proposal, for example, but there were some questions asked about that yesterday, uh, which allayed some fears, I think, of some of our colleagues, not that they're now for it, uh, but, I mean, it brought out some information about it, which many of the members don't know. And I think we owe it, obviously, eventually to, to all the people of the country, but even to ourselves in terms of our responsibility of, of representing them and trying to come up with the best possible thing to allow, allow members and through us and over television, pe people of the country to, to you know, to be immersed somewhat themselves for a couple of weeks in this subject matter. I, I, you know, 50 some hours is not too much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. It is, as uh, everybody keeps pointing out, one seventh of the economy, soon to be one fifth of the economy if we don't do something about controlling costs. And I think we have to, after we hear from all of these members and a few others who will be coming before us today and maybe next week as well, <clears throat> I hope we can go back and then and try to figure out a way to, to allow this to be presented to the House in a, in a sensible way. I know it's going to take a lot of time. I wish, frankly, that we just stay here and work on health care for two or three weeks. I hate to say that because plans already have been disrupted for everybody, but we should just work through and uh, spend two, two or three weeks that it's required for us to, to, to discuss this thoroughly amongst ourselves and on behalf of our, of our uh, constituents. So I won't go into any more discussion of the details at this point. It's not necessary. But I do hope, Mr. Chairman, that we can recommend to the leadership of both parties that we spend a really, a really substantial amount of time on this very substantial issue uh, on the floor sometime before we vote and, and give, t give a lot of time specifically, not so much to the individual committees, because as I just said a couple moments ago, that's not that useful type of debate usually, but for questions and answers and to go into, into real depth on each of the substitute proposals as they come before us. So at the very least, everybody will have a real understanding of what's, you know, what's, what's involved. I was really impressed, to say it once more, yesterday by the responses and the testimony we got from some of our colleagues. Um, and uh, I, want all of our, I want all of our colleagues to have that same opportunity. Thank you. Good.
Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with the gentleman from California and the request made by those testifying that we should have an ample, ample amount of time. I don't think this should be considered as a partisan matter. If you take it on the floor and you twist arms for a program that will not work for the American people, and I'm talking about the Democrats and the Republicans, health care uh, is not a partisan matter. We should come up with a plan that is, is workable, that satisfies the need for health care reform, and it's going to take time. Uh, the gentleman from California has pointed out it's enlightening indeed to hear the testimony here. But wouldn't it be great to, if the American people could hear the testimony and not just ramrod something through the House for the benefit of the next presidential election or for the benefit of the politician. I think we've got to work as a unit to develop something for the benefit of the American people. And the only way to do it is to let people have the time to express their views. I think one of the dis <coughs> disappointing things is that it'll be at least three weeks before all of these plans can be rated. And uh, we very well may be considering them on the floor uh, prior to the time that we have uh, the knowledge we really need to make a decision. It's too bad that this is waited until so close to the bitter end. Uh, if we'd come to the floor with this three months ago, uh, we would have had a much better chance to really, <coughs> each of us, know everything we need to know about all the possibilities. Uh, it's, an awful, it's an awful lot to squeeze into the little bit of time that's left. But you, we've, everyone is concerned. Everyone wants to talk about this. Every one of the 435 members. And an awful lot of them are on the are on the committees that have had something to do with the bill, too. It isn't that they're strangers. I, I, I know our task force has been working for two and a half years now on this subject. And uh, I know how close so many people feel to the, to the problems that, that are here. And now we've got uh, what amounts to uh, four or five weeks left in this Congress. Uh, tough time. Well, I'm glad to see that they've postponed action of the health care bill, and Mr. Chairman, I hope really they have, because we can't ramrod this thing down before any August reset. The people are on edge. The members of this Congress are on edge. You can't whip anyone into making the right decision. I think that the lesson was learned yesterday on the crime bill. There is a division of opinion on each and every uh, <coughs> proposal made. Substitutes, let's let people vent their spleen and come up with a program that is workable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer, California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, join in, in uh, thanking uh, you, Carlos, and Henry and Cliff for your thoughtful testimony and also the tremendous time and effort that you have put into this. Carlos has just said something that I think is very timely and needs to be underscored, and that is the fact that uh, over the last 18 months, we have regularly heard that it was President Clinton who brought the issue of health care reform to the forefront. And I will acknowledge that as president, he certainly has not only used the bully pulpit, but spent a great deal of time and effort focusing on the need for health care reform. But when Carlos reminded uh, this committee that it was two and a half years ago that the task force was formed on the minority side to deal with the kinds of improvements that we want to have made, really improving the present health care system rather than
seeing the potential for a government takeover of one seventh of the economy. I think that's something that uh, that this committee needs to be aware of, and the American people uh, need to uh, need to know. And I appreciate the fact that you have mentioned that, Carlos. Let me also say that something else that has been a real pet peeve of mine and the rest of my colleagues, certainly on this side of the aisle, has been this King of the Hill procedure, uh, which uh, Carlos, you, and Tom Bliley mentioned. And that is this, this problem of allowing the amendment that does not have the highest number of votes to actually prevail in the end. We had a debate on this uh, yesterday with the budget bill that was down on the floor, and we've had it uh, time and time again. And uh, I think Tom put it well when he said King of the Hill is really a game that's played on a, uh, uh, in school and really not when you're dealing with issues that, that come before this Congress. And so I'm hoping very much that as we look at the substitutes that are going to be most likely made in order on the health care issue, that we will not go under that procedure. But I do agree with that we're going to have uh, certainly a long and very vigorous and one of the most interesting debates that this Congress has ever seen on, uh, on a far-reaching issue like this. And I uh, look forward to uh, probably listening more than participating because, as Tony said, it's been a learning process for many of us on this committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Well, of course, you know, the King of the Hill uh, provision, uh, the reason uh, one of the uh, amendments with less votes could win is because each time it's a vote between that amendment and the prior amendment. So, so it's one amendment against the other. It's not that uh, everybody is opposed to each amendment, so you get down. So if the first amendment uh, passes, uh, and then you put it up against the second amendment, and the second amendment passes, even though it may have got fewer votes against the, the, the amendment that beat the first amendment, uh, th it's still a head-to-head -head fight between two amendments. So it's not that we scale the thing down and, and give it to the one that has the least majority vote. Well, if you'd yield on that, Mr. Chairman. I yield. <clears throat> it does, though, create the potential for one amendment to carry with 400 votes. Yeah, but that amendment then, is, is, is being opposed by another amendment. Right. It's not the same amendment. Right, but the, th the, but the fact of the matter is members do have an opportunity to say that they have voted for a strong amendment, assuming that's the first one, and then fewer amendment, uh, fewer members can vote on the weaker amendment. And many of those members who voted for the stronger amendment the first time know full well that there won't, won't be necessary on the last one. What I'm saying is that I just don't believe, and obviously Carlos and, and Tom, who've stated their concern about the King of the Hill procedure, agree with me, as I believe a lot of our membership uh, uh, agrees with me that, that that really is a way which does allow members to avoid accountability. I'm not saying it happens every time, and you're right in saying that, that clearly the, uh, the last amendment may get more votes than the previous amendment, but there is a potential for an avoidance of accountability under the King of the Hill process, and frankly, we have seen it on more than a few occasions. Yeah, but the King, King of the Hill process also guarantees that every one of these substitutes gets a vote. Yes, but I mean, if we had, if we go right down the line and have votes, I, I'm not saying that we should deny them and have a chance to vote. All I'm saying is that the amendment that in fact receives the highest number of votes should be the one that prevails. So I'm saying, yes, give each one of these measures a hearing, <laughs> But what we should allow, require, is that the, the one that receives the most votes should be the one that, that actually uh, carries. All right. First of all, A amendment passes. Then there's a substitute by B amendment. B amendment passes. Now, A amendment may have passed minus A amendment uh, by a 12-vote ma majority, and B amendment may have only passed A vote by two-vote majority. But there... It's an amendment. It's not the same as A going against minus A. It's it's a different it's a different contest. Well, I mean, if you just take this health care issue, the idea here is that we will have all of these different proposals: the Gephardt proposal, the bipartisan proposal, the Singer payer proposal, uh, the the plans that uh, these gentlemen have talked about. The idea is to give each one of them an equal chance. And it seems to me that the most responsible way for us to look at an issue like this is to have the amendment 
which receives the most votes prevail. In the long run, the, probably the last vote up of the King of the Hill has has an advantage. I don't say it doesn't have an advantage, but it, I, I just hate to, to keep hearing this over and over again that the uh, the vote with the lowest the, the substitute with the lowest majority vote uh, could very well uh, be the bill. When it could, because yes, it could. But but the problem is that it's going to be each none of these bills uh, go against one major bill. This one substitute is going against another substitute. Then the winner of that substitute goes against another substitute, and the winner of that substitute goes against another substitute. So you're not they're not all going against the same base text. So as they, they go along, uh, they either get the... Uh, but on chairman. this issue here, if, you, I mean, if you're looking at this issue, we have five basic plans, or may, maybe more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've talked about how each committee should each have five hours. We have different plans that, are, uh, that want to stand alone. Uh, and it seems to me that as we look at this, the prospect of King of the Hill does, as Carlos said, create a situation where the last... A vote is the one that has the greatest advantage, and we've seen that on more than a few occasions. And uh, I mean, I won't start enumerating them. I remember even on the on the uh, earthquake relief bill that we had, we had that uh, structured in such a way that the last one would be able to prevail. Uh, frankly, in a way to undercut some of the others, uh, we saw it um, uh, the other day on. Uh, well, I, I thought that we handled yeah. one of the other uh, rules poorly. Yeah, on the on the Kasich Penny uh, yeah. amendment that I guess is going to be yeah. brought up uh, right Mr. now. Mr. Chairman, I mean, I, I don't mean to. Sorry just to keep to, you all here to yeah, debate yeah. the whole King of the Hill well, procedure. Which we, I mean, I I can just remember the debate on most favored nations. All right. I do remember that. Today, uh, Pelosi was in the most favored position. Right. Lee Hamilton won. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree, and, but it was a pretty resounding margin. And, uh, well, I mean, the, the point that I'm making is, and it was because of the work of so many of us, <laughs> that we uh, beat those of you who were on the other well, side. I'm, I'm and, I mean, uh, it was, uh, I, I mean, I'm not saying that it can't happen, but, it, but the structure creates the potential for. But the structure also creates the ability for every substitute to be heard in its entirety. Mr. Chairman, well, let's just interject myself in, in this d discussion. I know that there are a couple alternative substitutes that will be offered that I want to vote for. And if I vote for one alternative and it passes, then I have to decide, well, I'm for that alternative and I'm for the other, the next alternative. Uh, I have to measure the, the two against Ab each other. Absolutely. And then if there's a third one, if uh, the second one wins, then I just have to decide between the second one and the third one, do I want... Do I want the second one? Do I want the third right. one? So I, the, the only thing, this is your debate on the rules is obviously your expertise. The only thing that I think all of us would ask is give us a fair opportunity to debate all these issues on the House floor. Let all the alternatives uh, uh, have the opportunity to be presented by those who sponsor them and give us a chance to vote for them. And don't put us in a position where uh, if we want to vote for a proposal that we can't do it because for fear that if we wanted to express ourselves and on behalf of the single-payer uh, position, for example, that would mean that I couldn't be for the Gephardt proposal. Right. Yep. So, uh, and like, this is the way to we do understand, it. If we understand the rules and we understand how the decision will be made, and it's an orderly way to decide, then the House will come out. Well, we understand, this, you know, Henry, that sure, you want to have an opportunity to do that, but some tough choices have to be made. And in making Don't that I know it. Don't yeah, I know exactly. it? I'm ready to make them, and so are you. Absolutely. Just give us the, just we give are. Us the rules by which we can vote those tough decisions. And I think that the we'll most responsible way for us to do that is to structure a rule so that the amendment which receives the most votes carries. I mean, that's that's the way it should be done around here. And uh, I think that this, this procedure, which was acknowledged by the chairman in response to Carlos's comment that the last standing amendment is the one that has the, uh, you know, the greatest potential. So I, I, I mean, it, it just uh, strikes me that, yeah, we've got some tough choices to make. And maybe that's what, maybe you should make the decision that, that, uh, that voting for single payer might not be the best thing for you to do. I wish you wouldn't vote for single payer, because I. Because <laughs> you don't want me to express my position on that. No, no, no I just favorable. don't. I, I just don't want you, you to vote in favor. You disagree with me. I, I, yeah, I disagree with your position. But I suggest That's you vote no on that. Yeah. And I, I will too. I'm going to try and convince you to vote no on the single payer plan. <laughs> Carlos, now you no say you, orders. you want the opportunity to vote on at least two of these plans, isn't that so? Well, I, I would like to be able to vote on all of them, but there are two of well, them. Well, let's. Well, listen to the way that are. 
are very very important to me that we have an opportunity to. I think that this I is the way to get there. The bipartisan bill are the are the ones that I am most concerned about, mm -hmm. and I guess it's because we put so much of our lives in, in into this thing o over a two and a half year. And I know all all of us. Uh, the uh, since the Clinton plan came out, the Democrats have been working on this for a year and a half, almost as long as we have. Not quite, but uh, we're. We're con we're concerned about these issues, and we I, want a fair shot on the floor. I think I mentioned it yesterday. I was looking over some campaign old campaign paraphernalia, and I found my uh, campaign card that I used in 1972. And I said, "Please send me to Washington so I can help Ted Kennedy pass a health care bill." <laughs> <laughs> now I I know there's a saying that some beer has that some things can't be hurried. <laughs> I think there's some middle ground there. Yeah, Mr. Right. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you should be real. Right. Mr. Chairman, but Carlos Moorhead ran in 1972. He's a classmate of yours, and I assure you that was not his campaign slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Cliff, um, just two points I wanted to make. Uh, maybe you could help me out. When we passed Medicare or Social Security, the Transportation Act, or the Clean Air Bill, what was the format for those? I mean, obviously, we weren't around here for the Social Security Act, but I mean, it I, seems I, like the Rules Committee could go back and research and found out find out how the debate was structured, and at least members could be aware of how those bills were structured. Well, the nation. last one that comes to mind is the most favored nation status, mm -hmm. and this was, uh, we gave Pelosi the most favored position, and Hamilton won. And I will tell you that it did concern us, the fact that Pelosi was given the most favored position on that, and, and that was one of the reasons that I spoke in opposition to the rule, but the, the margins were so overwhelming on that issue, uh, and it was done in a bipartisan way, obviously, uh, but but it, it, it was not as fair as it could have been, and that was acknowledged by Jerry and others. Well, does the gentleman agree that that uh, no matter how you structure a rule, that somebody gets an advantage? Somewhere? Well, I think that we can do it in a more fair and balanced way, and that fair and balanced way is to have us create a situation where under the, if we're going to have the King of the Hill procedure, the amendment which receives the greatest number of votes should be the one that prevails. I believe that that's the, the uh, first way to deal with it. Mr. Mr. Solomon. Well, Mr. Chairman, I apologize to the, <clears throat> to the members who are testifying before us. We've, uh, I had to give a report to the uh, Republican conference on, uh, on the crime bill rule. And, uh, oh, I'll tell you how uh, that's going to come out. Oh, oh, you were? <laughs> I should have spoken to you before I went to the uh, Republican conference. But, uh, uh, you know, the, um, it's a question of who gets uh, treated fair. And I think um, all 435 members of this body need to be treated fairly because uh, whatever we do is going to affect the lives and the livelihood of all of those people. And. Uh, uh, it's it's hard then to structure a rule that is going to be fair to everyone. But uh, in the American people, I think really are interested in in a bipartisan effort to to fix what might be broken with the system. And we all have different views of that. Henry, your view is that uh, you know the government probably could uh, uh, could jump in there and uh, and and straighten it out. Uh, my personal view is that that would be the wrong way to go. But okay. and I and I but I do think that there are things that need to be uh, need to be fixed. Uh, okay. Portability and previous uh, 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 pre-existing uh, pre conditions. Uh, uh, those things. I think medical malpractice is so terribly terribly important. Uh, uh, I came out of the uh, uh, the banking and insurance field many years ago, and uh, uh, the fact is that. Uh, we just cannot have juries and judges handing out huge punitive damage awards to people who might have a lifetime income of, uh, of say, a million dollars, and they get a settlement for 30 million. Well, somebody has to pay for that. All of us who uh, then are, are buying insurance end up paying <clears throat> for the difference between that one million uh, cost and the, and the 30 million. So, you know, it's just a question of, of what needs to be done. Getting back to the bipartisan issue, I really believe that the best way to do this so that we could treat everybody fairly is to, because we have nine proposals here uh, by you gentlemen. Uh, the major proposals, of course, are the, uh, the Gephardt Democrat proposal, so to speak, the uh, Republican Bob Michael proposal, so to speak, uh, the single payer 
and the bipartisan. And I really think if we were going to send the right kind of a message and have a, a really decent debate and let the chips fall where they may, we could do it by taking the, the bipartisan, which, is, which is, has supporters on both sides of the aisle, and make that the base text of the bill. And then let the Republicans offer their substitute to it, let the Democrats offer their substitute, let the, the single-payer people offer their substitute, let everybody be heard. But that, I think, the, the American people would accept that. And uh, they would know that we were trying, that uh, nobody was out there to scuttle the programs or, or scuttle each other's, but to really try to, to come up with a product that would end up uh, getting a, a, a vast majority of the vote, not just 218 votes, but, but uh, a substantial majority. Then we know it's going to work. Otherwise, we're going to get into that same situation we had with catastrophic health insurance when uh, uh, Claude Pepper was here, and and we turned around, and had to repeal the thing, uh, you know, the, the following year, and we can't put ourselves in that position. And you people know better than anybody else because you've dealt with this for years. But you know, we could repeal catastrophic health the next year and do just a uh, a little bit of damage. If we try to fix this and then come back and repeal it. It's going to be a disaster. That's why we have to be so careful. So uh, hopefully, Mr. Chairman, that's how we could structure a rule that would be, be fair to everybody. You don't think we should use uh, uh, one of the committee's build as base texts, one that successfully well, came through the committee process? Is like we always do. Well, Mr. Chairman, the trouble is none of these bills have come through the committee process now. Uh, Mr. Gephardt's bill has been totally changed. Uh, uh, they're being rewritten right this minute in the back room. Senator Mitchell, I just was talking to the senator over there. He just wrote a new bill uh, five minutes ago. That didn't come out of any, any committee, and uh, it's so confusing. Uh, I, I sent out a newsletter, and I had a chart here showing all of these, uh, these nine major proposals. This was about a month and a half ago. Since that time, there are another 18 proposals out there. Uh, so the American people are confused. Members of Congress are confused. Well, you know, it reminds me of the lady that went up to George Washington's uh, home, and uh, they were showing all the relics up there, and the, one of the curators came, and they showed this lady, this is the original hatchet that George Washington chopped down the cherry tree with. She says, no kidding. The original? He says, this is the original. And of course, it's had three new handles and two new heads. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think we've got a bill here that's probably got three new handles and two new heads. At least. <laughs> thank Any you. other questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Wayne Allen, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Allard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my comments. I have an amendment uh, that I would like to have an opportunity to introduce to any bill that we end up working on. I think it's an important amendment, whether we're talking about the so-called Clinton health care plan, whether we're talking about the Mitchell plan or the Gebhardt plan, or whether we're talking about the Roland Billy Rockus or the Bob Michael plan or any combination thereof. This is an and amendment that will go to any one of those plans? Yes, and I, with a little bit of modification in the wording, uh, you know, to make it technically fit into the amendment, it is one that would fit into any one of those amendments. But what I have to propose to the committee, Mr. Chairman, is an amendment that I've consistently offered uh, to the administration's health care reform bill or plan, but which um, should be applied to any health care plan. In fact, I uh, introduced this amendment uh, uh, in both the, on the budget committee on the House side, and then we had similar wording uh, of this amendment adopted on the Senate side in the budget resolution that was taken out. And it directs that um, health care reform be on budget. Uh, anytime you have mandatory expenditures and mandatory revenues, that you put that on budget. And it's not unprecedented. And we have a number of programs where we've done that with, and I'd be glad to get into that detail if you'd like. And basically, it means that any mandated premium shall be scored as a tax, and any related expenditure is to be treated as a federal outlay. Early in 1994, 
the Congressional Budget Office was asked to render a decision uh, regarding the proper budget treatment of the Clinton Health Plan. The CBO uh, stated clearly that the Clinton Plan should be scored completely on budget. Uh, however, the CBO decision was advisory and it is clear that the Congress must specify in legislative language of health care reform what the budget treatment will be. I believe this amendment is necessary if, if Congress approves a health plan that involves mandates. Uh, this is necessary because this type of plan federalizes the health care of this nation and the tax and budget consequences of that action should be honestly reflected in the budget. In recent months, it appeared that Congress might be moving away from a plan that included mandates. Uh, however, it has become clear that the leadership now intends to have the House vote on a plan very close to the Clinton plan. And I will note that we are here today discussing mandates or amendments for H.R. 3600, the Clinton bill, as modified by Gebhardt. It is therefore critical that Congress spell out the proper budget treatment. Uh, Congressman Penny and I offered this language as legislation in the House earlier this year where it attracted over 140 co-sponsors. Uh, I offered this amendment in the House Budget Committee earlier this year. It was approved and included in the budget re resolution. It was also included in the Senate bill and unfortunately it was removed in conference. Uh, obviously I, until just this morning, had not uh, seen any kind of summary of the Gebhardt bill. Uh, and I don't know uh, what's entirely in the bill regarding budget treatment, but it looks to me, and taking a very quick glance at it this morning, that we do have uh, health care cooperatives in it, so it makes this amendment a very germane amendment, I think, to the issue. Uh, however, this is an extremely, uh, there is an extremely important point that I want to make, and I'd like to quote from the August 9, 1994 uh, CBO analysis of the Mitchell bill. Now, this report makes a point once again that Congress must decide on the proper budget treatment uh, for the health care reform. And let me uh, insert that in the record. A mandate requiring that individuals purchase health insurance, and this is coming from the CBO report, would be an unprecedented form of federal action. Let me go through that sentence again. A mandate requiring that individuals purchase health insurance would be an unprecedented form of federal action. The government has never required individuals to purchase any goods or service as a condition of lawful residence in the United States. Therefore, neither existing budgetary precedents nor concepts provide conclusive guidance about the appropriate budgetary treatment of a mandate. Good arguments can be made both for and against, including in the federal budget, the cost to individuals and firms of complying with the mandate. It's only appropriate, therefore, for policymakers to resolve this issue through legislation. Some budget analysis argue that the cost of the mandate should be included in the federal budget, but these transactions would be predominantly public in nature. A second argument for inclusion, closely related to the first, is that the premiums that people would have to pay to comply with the mandate would be compulsory payments and should therefore be regarded as governmental receipts. A third argument is that including these costs in the budget would preserve the federal budget as a comprehensive measure of the amount of resources allocated through collective political choice at the national level. Also the CBO, CBO listed arguments against on budget treatment, but the point is that the budget treatment uh, should be addressed and my amendment should be voted on uh, whichever one of these um, routes that the committee decides to go or the full House decides to go. Obviously, uh, much of the Gebhardt bill will have to be on budget, uh, Medicare, Medicaid Part C, uh, subsidies for small business and any increases in current program. However, this amendment, the mandated premiums, uh, or however, without this amendment, the mandated premiums, which are clearly payroll taxes, will escape budgetary discipline. Uh, Robert Samuelson alluded to this issue in a recent Washington Post op-ed. He stated that the mandate would represent a new category of entitlements worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It is a second budget conveniently placed off budget. Uh, Mr. Samuelson goes on to state that political pressure will make it irresistible to continually ratchet up uh, payroll taxes to finance attractive benefits. As he puts it, every new benefit will seem compelling every possible restriction will seem cruel. This makes the case for the need for budget discipline or on budget treatment as the only effective way to achieve this discipline. Why is discipline necessary? 
While in 1965, the government projected that by 1990, Medicare would cost between $9 billion and $12 billion by 1990. Uh, I'm sorry, in 1965, the government projected that by 1990, Medicare would cost between $9 billion and $12 billion by 1990. It actually cost $107 billion, and now, only four years later, will cost $144 billion. The Kerry Danforth Entitlement Commission has warned us this week that entitlements will soon consume the entire federal budget unless we act to control costs. This health plan would be the largest entitlement in history. The first step in controlling its costs is dealing with it honestly on the federal budget. So I'm here to ask permission to go ahead and put that forward as an amendment and to put uh, any mandated uh, health care expenditures or revenues uh, within the budget so they can be adequately and and forthrightly discussed on the floor of the House, and the members understand how their taxpayer dollars are being spent. Well, I know the gentleman has filed his amendment seasonably, so it uh, it can be taken up, and we'll we'll look at it as we look at the major substitutes that have been presented to the committee. I thank the chairman for that, Mr. Solomon. And Wayne, first of all, uh, let me commend you for your. Uh, efforts in trying to make sure that we keep uh, these kind of mandates on budget. You've been doing that since uh, the first day you came here, and you're a very valuable member in uh, the Budget Committee in, uh, in doing so. And secondly, I want to commend you for the work you did on the uh, Joint Committee to reform the Congress. Uh, that committee met for uh, hundreds of hours uh, for over a year. I think you attended every meeting, every minute of every hour. I, uh, you certainly have perseverance. Uh, you mentioned uh, mandates uh, that the American people buy health insurance, and uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, that's going in the absolute opposite direction when you talk mandates on people. And instead of mandates uh, that require Americans to buy health insurance, uh, we ought to be going in the other direction, offering incentives that encourage the American people to buy insurance and be able to do it at an affordable rate. And, uh, you know, uh, again, if any of you have figured your income taxes and you, you uh, all, every single month you save every little bill, every drug bill, every doctor's bill, uh, any kind of insurance premium bill, and you put them in your folder marked 1994 uh, income taxes, and then you sit down in February or whenever you do and you go to figure out the medical deductions you're going to have, and you figure all those deductions, you end up, you don't save anything under existing law. And if we gave every American the right to write off 100% of their insurance premium up to the uh, a level of 4,000 or whatever that arbitrary figure might be, uh, to write off 100% of their out-of-pocket cost for insurance premiums and out-of-pocket medical expenses, such as the deductible. If you've got a $250 deductible and you paid the first $250, you ought to be able to deduct that and your insurance premium from your overall inco uh, uh, income tax. In other words, if you make $40,000 and your out-of-pocket expenses are $3,000, then you ought to be able to deduct that from $40,000 and you only pay income tax on the remaining $37,000. In other words, that would save the American people millions of dollars. Um, and if we then had really meaningful uh, tort reform uh, dealing with medical malpractice, that could re reduce the, the, the premiums. Uh, uh, these are the directions we ought to be going instead of trying to mandate. But uh, your, uh, getting back to your particular amendment, uh, this committee probably is going to make four or five major substitutes in order. And uh, if they do, your amendment, which, which carries such widespread bipartisan support, ought to be made in order to any of the, the amendments, that are the, uh, the substitutes that are going to survive, because it's terribly important that we do keep these mandates on budget. So I, I really do commend you for coming before us and offering this approach. Well, I appreciate the gentleman's support on this. You know, we have two CBA, CBO reports that talk about the importance of keeping this on budget. The last one we got just a few days ago, and it talks about the unprecedented nature of these mandates where we're putting them in cooperatives or alliances. And uh, I think if we're really going to keep a good solid hand on what's happening on our budget, 
and I sound like a member of the budget committee, but uh, which you are. <laughs> that's right, which I am. But uh, uh, I think we really need to have that accountability in the budgeting process. I don't think this is a partisan issue. I think this is a budget issue, and how much the members of the, of the legislative body wants to keep control of what's happening in the way of expenditures, whether it's a bureaucracy, whether it's an independent agency uh, so that you've sort of set up out here on its own that's going to basically have a market monopoly. There's a couple of instances where I mentioned in my remarks where we've done this before. We've done this with the United Mine Workers of America and their retiree health benefits, where uh, the railroad company collects the benefits, passes out uh, to the needed members, but basically it's a non-budget item. And the other area where we've done this is the Federal Unemployment uh, Trust Fund, uh, where we give the states basically the ability to collect those funds and then they, they, they take care of the qualifications, but it's a non-budget item. And it's pretty much along with the cooperatives that have been mentioned in the Gebhardt bill, the alliances that come up in both the Mitchell and the um, uh, Clinton health care plan. Uh, even though there are no mandates in the Mitchell bill or the um, uh, Billy Rockus uh, rolling bill, as I understand, um, I still think we should have this as a matter of, of law so that when this budgets, these budgets come through in future years, that all members are understanding just exactly uh, where we're coming for if anybody has an, an, in, an interest in trying to, to set up a, a health care cooperative or some type of an alliance. And I would guess that probably this issue will be before the Congress more than just this year, that it will be future years, it will be before the Congress. And I think the earlier we address that and get it into everybody's thinking, the better off we'd be. Well, it certainly would help, and um, uh, you know, when we, anytime you have programs like this and they turn into entitlement programs and they are off budget, you just lose total control of them, and, and you never know really what those costs are, and there, there's no way to budget for it because you're always doing it prospectively, and uh, uh, that's why your amendment would be so badly. I really do appreciate your coming. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank for your you. Time and uh, Mr. Solomon. The. Uh, Next witness from the Judiciary Committee will be the Honorable William J. Hughes of New Jersey. Thank you, Bill. Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Solomon. First of all, I want to thank you for receiving my testimony. I don't envy you your task. You must be overwhelmed and not knowing what kind of a target you have. You have a moving target, so it is not going to be easy. Uh, I'm here because I have two amendments, one out of the Judiciary Committee and also one that I've noticed on long-term care as the chairman of the Older Americans Caucus. Would you like to hear on both? Save some sure. time? All right. First, Mr. Chairman, I, I, we don't hear much talk about the process by which we are going to review claims that are denied primarily uh, or where there's allegations of discrimination. And I think you'll agree that we're talking perhaps about three billion claims. So we have to have a process that's fair and reasonable, that accords individuals an opportunity to be heard, to have their day in court. And I, I suspect you're like I am. In my district office operation, I hear from a lot of people, particularly in the disability review area, that are never heard. I mean, they're heard at the end of the process after a year, year and a half. And usually it's an administrative law judge that makes the decision and they reverse a very substantial portion of the cases in those reviews, as you know. Because we process them, as you do, on a daily basis. And so, in attempting to develop a process that's fair, reasonable, balanced, that will not overload the federal courts, because we're courts of limited jurisdiction, and it's a process that belongs in the state's court, state courts to begin with, ultimately. I think we've developed a process that will serve us very, very well. And it was reported out of judiciary in H.R. 3600, and it's a grievance and appeal process of the Health Security Act that I, I think is the one that we need to take a look at. First of all, it provides for notification information right up front where a claim has been turned down with a period of time when the applicant, the claimant, has to be notified, and the reasons. And then in wait until, and instead of waiting until an administrative law judge, we move that process forward. The next review is by someone who did not turn the claim down, where you have a right to have counsel present, where the person can appear early in the process, not at the end of the process, before an administrative law judge, in many instances, 
where they can produce testimony, where medical experts will be present to make that decision. Everybody has to exhaust those administrative remedies first. If there is still a turndown, it goes to, for a de novo review to a state panel where each state will constitute a, constitute a board that will hear that testimony de novo before that board. If, in fact, the decision is against the claimant again, then that claimant may file suit in a state court. If, in fact, it alleges discrimination of some kind, then a suit can be filed in the federal district court. I propose an amendment to my provisions that would permit either a de novo appeal, that is a jury trial at the end of that administrative process, or a hearing based upon the hearing record below. In the bill submitted, it indicated that it would have to be on the hearing record when you filed suit in a, in a state court, on the hearing record below, unless it could be shown it's not supported by a substantial amount of evidence. We've heard some complaints from the administration and others who believe that sometime in the process there should be a jury trial, and we agree that we probably should make that modification. But it's a process that is not convoluted like many of the, of the provisions that have come before us. I think the legislation submitted by the administration uh, is much too complex. It will, would be counterproductive, and I think we need to have a process much like we have developed in judiciary, which uh, carried the day there. I'd be very happy to respond to any questions. There are some ERISA problems. I think it should be made clear that this is a process that's used. It's fair, it's reasonable, it gives individuals a day in court, and it moves the process forward unlike the present administrative process. Has this been uh, reported out of committee? Reported out of judiciary, yes. What was the vote? My... You remember what the vote was? Voice vote. Voice vote. Voice vote. There, there, was, there was pretty general consensus that the process was fair, reasonable, balanced. I might say that we worked with the state chief justices around the country in developing the process. They have not had time, they haven't had a formal meeting to approve it, but they have worked with us in developing this process. And we have heard from some of the leaders in the conference of state chief justices that this is a process that is fair, reasonable, and one that they can support. Uh, do you have another amendment also? Yes, I have an amendment on long-term care. As uh, uh, the chairman and, and uh, the ranking Republican knows, uh, I have been very active in older American issues, as have I know you. And I think one of the most important issues that face all older Americans is long-term care. I think the majority leader's uh, legislation moves us certainly uh, in, in a very positive and in the right direction. And I've noticed the amendment because I think that we have to implement long-term care within a year of the legislation being uh, implemented into law for a number of reasons. I've traveled like you have to nursing homes, extended care facilities, and there are so many there that do not belong there. They wouldn't be there if we could care for them at home. And we have to make community-based care, it seems to me, the centerpiece of any health care initiative. That long-term care component is very, very important. Assisted services will not bankrupt the system. I think it can be financed, as, uh, as I met uh, with the majority leader and others just a week ago with uh, most of the major older American groups, uh, the group, the handicapped, uh, the special population groups uh, to talk about long-term care. Uh, it won't bankrupt the system for a number of reasons. First of all, we can use the existing network of area agencies. We already have uh, area offices on aging throughout the country. They're, they and other spopu special population agencies are, national, are a natural network, provide assisted services to keep individuals in their home as long as they can stay in their home. If they You're just talking have, about the, like the Visiting Nurse Association? Yes, I'm talking about... Community uh, health centers and health clinics. And area offices on aging. Every, every county, uh, 
most counties have area offices on aging. They also, we also have in place uh, federal programs under the Older Americans Act, like RSVP and Green Thumb and Senior Companion. These are senior citizens that, that basically are assisting in the community. They're already providing assisted living to keep individuals in their home. We can build a network. network. We don't have to create a whole new bureaucracy. Uh, it makes sense because we're financing in extended care facilities, nursing homes, people don't belong there. And it's, it's cheaper to keep in a home and it's much more humanitarian. The average person lives in a nursing home about 16 months. We have people that, that don't have their faculties in nursing home. If you've visited, I'm sure you have, nursing homes recently, you have 22-year-olds in a nursing home surrounded by older Americans. We have, peop we have people that scream half the night in a bed next to someone that, that has their faculties. And many of them do not belong in that facility. We have not developed the network of community-based services. We have people that really are too sick to be at home but don't need the skilled care of a nursing home. We haven't developed intermediate care. We have families that have an Alzheimer's patient in the family. And they have to work to keep things going, but they don't know what to do with their spouse because they wander off. And we haven't developed those services, so what happens? They drop out of the workforce. And in some areas, we've developed adult daycare. We've developed Alzheimer's care. In my area, one of my counties has a, uh, has an organization called Caring that recognized a need a number of years ago. And they've, they've developed adult daycare. Is that a volunteer? Yes, mostly volunteer. Much of it's volunteer, but it was the dream of uh, a woman by the name of Ann Underland. She and her husband were missionaries for a number of years, and they've developed this in my backyard, and I am attempting to interest other counties in that. But it's the kind of community-based services that makes sense, and that's the direction that we have to go. I don't have to tell you, long-term care is one of the most important issues for special populations, older Americans and the handicapped. Now, how do we pay for it? Well, in the majority leaders, uh, Mark, uh, and, and that's as a result, of a meeting that took place about two weeks ago between special populations that I convened and the majority leader, we're using as one of the major f funding mechanisms Part B Medicare, which as you know is out of control. We have people in this country that are making $150,000 a year in retirement and we're providing a 75% subsidy. We're subsidizing those who can afford to pay their health care. We ought to be phasing out that subsidy at a particular Figure. It seems to me if you're making $80,000 or $90,000 a year, you know, you ought to be paying a little more than 25% of that. And you should phase it out at a, at a point when you don't need that subsidy. I mean, the public is, at this point, the public treasury that cannot afford it is providing that. And we can use that to raise a very substantial amount of money as a part of the funding source. And we will save resources by the monies we save in reordering priorities and developing home health care delivery using older American programs. It's a win-win-win situation. We're also trying to find ways, and we should, to keep older Americans involved in the mainstream of activities. And this, this is a function that they can perform very, very well. So all the way around, we strengthen the Older Americans Act. We provide long-term care in a meaningful fashion, and we don't create a whole new bureaucracy. Uh, Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Solomon. Well, Mr. Chairman, first of all, uh, let me say to Bill Hughes, uh, Bill is uh, going to be leaving this body after 20 years, and uh, how he can be here for 20 years and look as good as he does, and uh, look at you and me and uh, wonder what happened. But uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Please just take care of yourself. Just take care of yourself. <laughs> but uh, you have been such a respected and valuable uh, member of this body, Bill. We're, we really are going to miss you, and uh, and you've just proved that with your testimony here because uh, you are so sincere and really in what you're trying to do. And uh, uh, just a couple of questions on your First Amendment. Uh, uh, you mentioned the legislation submitted by by the administration. Uh, your First Amendment is not in the administration's no. or 
or which is now the Gephardt bill. So you need to be able to offer that that's, to the Gephardt bill. That's correct. Bill. That's correct. And what about single payer? I mean, if, uh, does it fit into there too, or? Yes, it, it would. It would fit into fit any in scheme. Anywhere. I mean, this this is a, pro a grievance process, an appeals process mm -hmm. that is fair, balanced, makes sense, and we should apply it really, mm -hmm. no matter what comes out. Right. Okay. Um, on the uh, on the second amendment, and again, I want to just commend you for the work you've done on on your uh, your task force uh, for older Americans because uh, um, it really has helped. You know, long term care uh, to help older Americans stay in their homes uh, is something we just really need to concentrate on. Either keeping them in their homes or allowing their adult children to be able to keep them in their in the children's homes. And we just uh, are so lacking. And uh, I've gone through this with my uh, my family uh, in recent years. And uh, but uh, and there are just so many pathetic cases out there. I was struck by the uh, by the uh, volunteer program you were talking about uh, dealing with uh, helping to take care of uh, people with Alzheimer's. And if if that organization has anything in writing, I'd love to see that. I'll be uh, happy to furnish it to you. We it, sure could use. It has something. enjoyed fantastic success. Mm. We, we could use something like that all over this country, uh, and I, I really would like to look into it. Uh, the, uh, and you also mentioned the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, people with incomes of $150,000 enjoy a 75% subsidy uh, uh, from Medicare Part B, and that is true. And, um, and uh, my balanced budget, as a matter of fact, uh, Porter Goss, you were one of the major sponsors of our balanced budget, but we did uh, eliminate uh, those 75% subsidies for people with incomes over $120,000. And uh, if we're going to tighten belts and we're going to take care of the people that need the help, we just can't be subsidizing people with those kind of incomes. So they really do need to be means testing. I don't really have any questions. I understand both your amendments, and uh, we'll certainly do everything we can to help. I and again, thank, thank you. you for all you do. Oh, thank you for this. Bill, so we have a, a project. Uh, that's sort of like a pilot project with the hospital in Boston who takes care of the elderly people for their physical uh, uh, purposes and then because they are so old they they have stay in contact with them in their home so in case they become disoriented or if they need any further help and I, I guess it's working out pretty well so it's they don't just get cut off as soon as they leave the hospital because many of them are living alone and and they probably just couldn't fend completely by themselves and it's been a project that's been in being uh, it's worked out with the Deaconess Hospital up in Boston and uh, and I, I it's been fairly successful which would go along uh, some that's of the other exactly things. what we're trying to do you know, on a systematic basis Mr. Portagos thank you Mr. Chairman uh, Bill I'm sorry I apologize for arriving late um, I'm, of course, very interested being from Florida in the, the provisions for the uh, long term. And that is a major problem and it concentrates. I know you have them as well in New Jersey, concentrations of senior citizens where this, this takes on a special meaning. And I think the approach of, uh, of the, it's clear what the solution is, it's a question how to pay for it. And I think the approach that you've talked about is making sure that we don't make the same mistake we made with catastrophic where people didn't understand and were frankly unfairly being asked to pay for something else that wasn't really relevant to them and their needs or what they were paying for. Uh, I see a direct nexus between the approach you're suggesting and the benefit. The person who's paying gets that's the benefit. Right, exactly and I think that is a world of difference uh, and I think that is the area that we ought to proceed. Uh, and I know some of the uh, other bills that are out there uh, have those provisions in them already. At least one of them does. I know the bipartisan bill does. I don't know about all the others for sure. Uh, and I think that's the way to go. And I thank you very much for bringing it to well, our attention. You, but that, that nexus is there. And, it, uh, and you're right. That's why I think one of the reasons why we lost uh, catastrophic. Thank you very much. I thank you. Thank you very much. The Honorable George Geekus of Pennsylvania. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to be permitted to submit a written copy of my testimony for the record. Without objection. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, it becomes apparent with every passing hour that we are not prepared to deal with the health care issue. We as a Congress are not prepared, nor are the American people prepared to launch into some great movement to throw out the old system and entertain a new one. Now, 
I'm not just uh, speaking for one who has tested the opinion of my own people in my own district. I wrote a letter to the president a month ago in which I welcomed gridlock, saying that gridlock has come to the aid of the American people. It has caused us to stop, look, and listen as to what they're saying, what they're determining are the real issues, and their fears and trepidations about launching into a new health system. What has happened is that the polls show that 65% of our people favor postponing the ultimate debate on health care till next year to allow us to stop, look, and listen, to allow us as members of Congress to really prepare ourselves for this mammoth issue and to allow us to deal with the opinions back home in preparation for the vote that we ultimately have to cast. You say, Mr. Chairman, others say, that we're prepared to do that next week. I, I really doubt it. It is so complex and so full of power plays and intricate uh, complexities of issues that no one is going to be able to cast a vote with a sense of proportionality in this uh, momentous issue. So my bill, my amendment, which I filed with your committee, if permitted to be heard, would simply allow the creation of a bipartisan commission of the same type that was created for the Social Security system when it ran into serious problems and which you and I then helped to foster in our adoption of the recommendations of that bipartisan commission. It was made up of nine people, including key members of the legislature, or of the Congress, as we recall, and their recommendations, almost whole cloth, were adopted by the uh, Congress. Now, what would my bill do? It would create this bipartisan commission. It would do about the same thing as the Blue Ribbon Commission did in Social Security and report back to us by March the 1st. One area that they would have at hand that would be very helpful will be reports from the various states as to what they have done in the last couple of years in health care. What kinds of new health care issues have they resolved? What kind of managed competition or one-payer system or other kinds of uh, new ideas have been incorporated in the state plans already? What have the hospitals, in conjunction with other hospitals, already accomplished? Aren't they way ahead of the curve, ahead of us even, in what they've already accomplished? Doctors, HMOs, all the various new partnerships that have evolved. Why shouldn't we take those into consideration and a great overview of all that is happening in the states and the localities and have the Bipartisan Commission pick out the best, call out the worst, and put a recommendation package together for us for next year. We're not abandoning the issue here. We're saying we're not prepared. And I believe wholeheartedly we're not prepared. The, then uh, we, we're going to quote Robert Samuelson again, the, the columnist. Now, he's no genius perhaps in your mind, nor in mine, but he says start over next year. In the letter that I sent to the president a month ago, I said he then could take, reinstate the leadership that he has exhibited, the president, by incorporating this idea of a bipartisan commission to review all that we've done as a Congress, all that every committee has done, every individual member of the Congress, the states, the local people, the private industry, the insurance companies. All of them have been involved in the last two years in various steps that they've taken on every phase of the health care issue. Why can't we put all of this together in front of a bipartisan uh, commission, which then would ensure a bipartisan solution in 1995. That's what my bill does. I ask that you uh, consider it and, and allow it to, uh, to be debated. Question, when should this come up? If all the amendments fail, not one of them of the substitutes gains a majority, neither Gephardt nor the bipartisan and so forth, we can then fold up the shop and say we don't have health care. Maybe that would be an appropriate time to allow for saving the issue and keeping it before Congress by adopting my amendment or at least having a vote on it. Or maybe it should be uh, 
permitted to be heard at the beginning to, de to, to set the atmosphere and the stage. If my bill fails to start with, we are saying then, let's go on with the debate now, and then go on to consider all the substitutes to which the chairman has, has referred. If it passes, then the rest of the debate becomes moot, because we're saying, let's take all these ideas and put them through the, the uh, arbiter of, uh, of a commission that would be formed uh, by the president with the consent of the Congress and have the Congress look at every single issue uh, next year. That's the gist of my suggestion and my proposed amendment. Thank you. Mr. Billinson, any questions? Mr. Portagas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Geeks, I think that's a, a very intriguing way on to yeah. proceed, uh, particularly given the, uh, yeah. the logjam we, we seem to have uh, right now in front of us. Um, let me ask a question about this commission. Yes. When you start talking about a commission down at the White House, it uh, raises the specter of uh, the 500 or so special friends of uh, yes, Mrs. Exactly. Clinton. That uh, you're not, not I, suggesting I want to create. I want to create a bipartisan commission, not a secret society. Okay. The the administration began by establishing a secret society with secret plans, with secret testimony, and and then pr produced a big secret, namely, what is this thing they produced? Because it has, all it has done is confuse the people and the members of Congress. Not a secret society, the same type of blue ribbon commission that openly would hold hearings, as did the Social Security Bipartisan Commission. I'm not sure if you were here at that time. That was before my day. Yes. And it, what it did, it fostered this overlook then gave the members of Congress a set of recommendations which were fiercely debated at that time. And by and large, the recommendations were accepted by the Congress. And lo and behold, we did save the Social Security system. We saved it for the next generation and beyond, some say, making it actuarially sound at least till the year 2027, and some say beyond. But well, we know that that's a success story that came out of a bipartisan commission, not a secret society like the one to which uh, the gentleman from Florida refers, uh, began this process and helped to exacerbate the problems which we now face. What secret society are you referring to? The, I was, uh, <laughs> that's my euf not euphemism, but my own nomenclature for the 500-person task force that was put together by the, the president and the first lady, which for the first few minutes, first few months of their existence, worked in secret. Oh, I thought you were talking about the skull and bones. <laughs> well, maybe it was that part of it. I don't know. That was a, that was a hand they, down they, from the Bush administration sure, to the right. uh, Clinton administration. Right. It got confused in the transition, apparently. Right. And I, uh, I, a man from, uh, from Florida, a colleague, Mr. Gibbons, uh, for whom I have great respect, uh, sat uh, in that chair uh, earlier in these hearings and, and said, you know, we've been debating health care so long we need to get on with it. The fact of the matter is the more we debate it, the more confusing it gets. And I think we need to have a winnowing process. And uh, I think an idea such as yours has uh, should be given full consideration. I thank you for bringing it forward. I thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, some of you people weren't here at the announcement, but uh, we said that it would work uh, roughly until uh, 1 o'clock, but uh, uh, because of some other members scheduled, uh, we will um, stop the hearing right after Mr. Watt and uh, return to the hearing uh, next week sometime. So Mr. Watt will be the last witness. Mello? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the um, committee. Um, I want to say at the outset that um, I support the leadership's bill. There are some things that need to be done to tinker with it in some respects, um, but um, I will be supporting the leadership's bill. What I'm here to do is to talk about an idea which I think uh, hopefully will make it better, at least based on all of the discussions that I have had with uh, everybody I've talked to uh, including uh, the majority leader, uh, supports the concept that, uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, the problem that I have with the bill is that 
it doesn't do what it does soon enough. Um, the, the bulk of the people in the country who are uninsured work for small employers and they are uninsured because their employers do not provide coverage. Uh, for that group of uh, employees, uh, implementation of the leadership's bill is delayed until January 1 of 1999. And I understand the practicalities of how we got to that because of the uh, political pool of uh, businesses uh, not to accept the employer mandate, um, but that puts those of us who have advocated for universal coverage soon and immediate in a very difficult position. And so the concept that I have uh, been pursuing uh, with universal support with those I've talked to about it is not the concept of mandating small businesses to uh, ensure their employees between now and January 1 of 1999, but providing some incentives for them to voluntarily do it between now and January 1, 1999. Uh, and so what I am advocating for is um, some phasing in of the subsidies that will be available to small employers starting January 1, 1999 as an incentive for those small employers who voluntarily between the implementation of this bill in January 1, 1999, would provide coverage to their employees. I think I speak for a group of employers out there, small employers, who would like to provide coverage to their employees but have no incentive to do it who have been waiting for health care reform to occur to do this, uh, but now are told that they don't have to do it until January 1 of 1999. Um, and so the concept that, uh, that I have been discussing with the leadership and with others uh, is simply to provide some amount of incentive uh, whether it's 10% of the full subsidy a year or 5% or uh, <laughs> set an amount and say we, we are appropriating this amount to support um, the, the voluntary offering of coverage by small employers. However we do it, do it before January 1 of 1999 so that those of us who have advocated for universal coverage can say that at least in this interim period um, we have done something to encourage that universal coverage to start occurring. Let me give you one specific example of um, uh, what I am faced with in my congressional district. Um, I have an interest in a small business. It is in an industry which uh, is uh, the provision of uh, board and care services for the elderly and handicapped. The industry standard is not to provide coverage to employees. We entered into this industry about two, three years ago um, and we have been wanting to provide coverage to our employees against the tide. This bill provides us no incentive to do that between now and 1999. And so what I'm uh, encouraging is uh, some incentives, some subsidy between now and then. Now, who, are, who do I have in support of this? Um, I have started to circulate a dear colleague letter for signatures. Uh, I have talked to, the, to uh, Mr. Gephardt about it. He supports the concept. 
I've talked to the CBC. They are supportive of the concept. I've talked to the single payer people. Mr. McDermott supports the concept. I've talked to, uh, my staff has talked to Mr. LaFosse, the chairman of the Small Business Committee, who supports the concept. But the question is, where do we get the money from? And I, that, that question I have not answered, but I think this bill would be substantially improved for those of us who support the concept of universal coverage. Not to mandate it, but to just encourage it voluntarily by setting a pool of money aside to do that between the passage of the bill and January 1, 1999. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Only to say to Mr. Watt that I agree with him completely. I suspect, you know, we don't know, of course, that and we don't know what, if any bill we'll get, that there's going to be voluntary movement toward more universal coverage more quickly than, than is required or suggested by the bill. But uh, if, if one can solve at least partially the, the funding part of your problem, it, it's certainly a, a way to go that I think virtually everybody would be supportive of. And uh, we shall certainly give your suggestion very serious consideration. Thanks. And I'll continue to work with the leadership to try to come up could, with a funding. You know, package. depending on how much it costs, uh, you can even phase in the uh, proposed cigarette tax, for example, a little more quickly than otherwise. <laughs> I knew he was going to take a no, shot. No, at no, no, didn't mean to. Be, but, but seriously, <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you know, if it's going to come anyway, it may not make all that much difference if it came a little faster. Well, actually, they uh, they've started to, interestingly enough, I think under this bill, they start the 15, 15 cent a year phase in immediately. It goes up to 45 or so. And goes up to 45, they, but they still don't start the subsidy immediately. Right. Um, we have looked at the cost of this. I understand that uh, funding the full subsidy once it's implemented for small businesses costs between six and eight billion dollars. A phased in subsidy uh, for those uh, small employers who, uh, let's assume you, you provided the full subsidy only to the 55% who currently provide coverage, that would be about $3 billion or, or thereabouts. And then the marginal cost would be the extra people who came on who agreed to do it, uh, and I think there would be some. Then if you phased it in, you could probably get the figure down to $1 billion would be um, yep. Sounds uh, doable. A substantial subsidy uh, to do what I'm talking about. Mel, what committee do you serve on? Um, banking, finance, and urban affairs, and uh, judiciary, and a temporary appointment on postal and civil service. Too, too bad you couldn't get a temporary on ways and means. Maybe you could further your ambitions. <laughs> um, well, I don't know what my ambitions are, but I would love to... to uh, uh, to be on ways and means. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's a subject for another day, I think. <laughs> I, I think your, pl your plan uh, sounds very uh, good, and, and I think it's doable, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is where is the funding, and, and we'll have to try to help you to see where the funding is on this, because we will have to come up with enough money uh, with some of the plans that we're looking at now. Mr. Portagas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that uh, you've made a very clear and articulate presentation. I'm certainly very much uh, interested in achieving a goal you're trying to do. My, my concern is the dollars, as the Chairman has said, and they're all competing dollars. And you know, a few witnesses ago, we had long-term health care, and then, you know, then we have another issue. And there, and there are so many people uh, trying to find so many different ways to do good things and pay for them that it's sort of hard to get it all together on one piece of paper, which is what we're going to have to do in here, and then decide which are the priorities and which are the ones we need to debate and which are the ones that the leadership wants to debate and which are the ones the minority wants to debate. And I, I think it's a long task. But I think that is a very worthy idea that clearly should be included in the debate, and I thank you for coming forward. Mr. Chairman, I have intentionally stayed away from the most difficult issue, which is the funding issue. Um, um, but we I noticed. would point out to the committee that uh, uh, just the early retirement provisions uh, they are talking about, something like 170 some billion dollars to fund. I'm talking about one billion dollars a year. I mean, for what I think everybody I have talked to uh, agrees 
is a wonderful idea. And um, I guess the real concern I have is that we go home having passed a bill that really, for the bulk of the uninsured people in this country, really doesn't do anything until January of 1999. Uh, and that's, that's uh, uh, we leave ourselves open for a lot of criticism. Yeah, especially in my state, uh, 49,000 people a month are knocked off the health care rolls. I mean, 49,000 people a month. And most of these people are working people. Mr. Chairman? Yes. How many people are hired a month in Massachusetts that get health care coverage that didn't have it? Well, I don't know. I, that 49,000... <laughs> I, I number is, is not a, a stable, it's, it's moving, you know, people are getting on, some people are getting I understand up. that, and it's not always the same 49,000. Yeah. And we've all got those problems. Uh, and, and I wanted to recommend to both, uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, in all seriousness, and, and uh, to Mel, that I think that the bipartisan bill actually front-end loads and gets at the problem you're talking about, the, the working poor problem, uh, pretty well with a subsidy program that I think is paid for. Uh, and does start up sooner, if memory serves me right now, and I invite you to take a look at it. I will but, do so. But uh, what I'm getting at in the 49,000 people being laid off, when they go back to get insurance and they've got a pre-existing uh, condition, and, they and may not be able to get their insurance. I understand that. I think every plan that has come before us takes care of that problem. I'm not aware of a single plan that doesn't cover pre-existing and portability one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's true, because that's the number one problem I think, for access. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee. Okay, we uh, have a vote on the floor, and as I said, that uh, we would recess uh, right after Mr. Watt's testimony. The committee will stand recess subject to the call of the chair. Mr. Chairman, do you have any idea what day that would be? Uh, I'm not trying to pin you down. There is some interest here. Uh, it might be uh, as early as Tuesday or as late as Wednesday. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No, we'll protect you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Ready stands adjourned. The House Rules Committee negotiates the structure for floor debate on health care reform. The House leadership is waiting for cost estimates on reform plans from the Congressional Budget Office. We expect House debate on health care to begin sometime in the next few weeks. This weekend on Book Notes, in anticipation of the upcoming Lincoln-Douglas debate reenactments on C-SPAN, author Merrill Peterson joins us to discuss his recent book,